Good afternoon and welcome to yet another extremely informative, extremely topical, and extremely timely AMET webinar. As many of you are most probably aware, on Sunday, the International um, Atomic Energy Administration announced that they have found traces of highly enriched uranium in Iran at the 84% level. That is only six percentages away from the 90% enrichment level necessary for nuclear bomb. <clears throat> and as most of you who are regular listeners um, to our webinar are almost most probably aware, Iran, Russia, and China have been forming a new, what we call, axis of evil. Iranian President Abraham Raisi, the renowned butcher of Tehran, just returned from Beijing with renewed agreements, and Chinese President Xi Jinping plans to visit Tehran. But even more troubling has been the closeness of the relationship between Tehran and Moscow. We all know by now that Tehran has been selling Moscow drones um, with which they have been executing the war crimes against the people of Ukraine. Um, but many are not that aware that Russia is selling Iran their highly sophisticated Sukhoi 35 supersonic jets um, with increased maneuverability that can avoid radar detection and the advanced S-400 missile detection system. Recently, Assistant Secretary of Defense John Kirby had described a Moscow and Tehran's relationship as, quote, unprecedented and growing. With these sobering thoughts, it's my pleasure to introduce you to one of AMET's newest members of the AMET team, Joseph Epstein. I'm extremely proud of Joseph, who was on the board of Students Supporting Israel at Columbia University and served in the IDF. Um, he has a very nice relationship with today's honored guest, Alex Grinberg. So I thought it would be terrific if Joseph were to handle today's webinar and to interview um, our featured speaker, Alex Grinberg. So Joseph, take it away. Thank you, Sarah. So today's speaker, Alex Greenberg, is an expert on Iran, Russia, and Islamist movements for the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. He holds an MA in Arabic language and literature and is fluent in Farsi, Arabic, French, English, Russian, and Hebrew. Alex's main research interests are Iranian intellectual history and modern Shia thought. He held several positions in the IDF Military Intelligence Research Department, including the role of captain, and aside from his role at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, he teaches Persian at Ariel University and is currently employed as a geopolitical and intelligence analyst in private firms. For those unfamiliar with the Jerusalem Institute for Strategic or for Strategy and Security, or JISS, it is a Jerusalem-based think tank that consists of a team of national security experts, intelligence officers, academics, and former politicians. JISS provides defense and diplomatic counsel to Israel's leaders, trains Israeli national security analysts, briefs foreign leaders and policymakers on Israel's security and foreign policy options, and conducts in-depth research on foreign policy challenges that Israel faces. They are a great source for a comprehensive realist analysis of Israeli foreign policy. Before we start, uh, I'd like to mention that our work is only possible with the support of you all. If you find what we do informative and helpful, consider sponsoring a future webinar or contributing to EMET. It is your help and support that allows us to continue with our important work on Capitol Hill to ensure a prosperous and peaceful Israel in the Middle East, fight the influence of the Iranian regime, increase US national security, and improve the welfare of Jewish Americans. Today's well webinar will be recorded for future viewing. And I encourage those of you who find the webinar informative to share the link once it has been sent out. If you have any questions for our speaker, please feel free to write them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alex Greenberg. Uh, shalom, good evening or good morning in America, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm uh, happy to be here. I thank you, Joseph, and the leadership of Ahmed for having given me the chance to talk about uh, some pressing issues such as Russia and Iran. And uh, the last thing I want to do is to appear an arrogant expert 
expert for everything. No, I'm not an expert for everything. I don't pretend to know everything about Iran, Russia, or anything else. Uh, simply, I was uh, born in Moscow, so Russian is my mother tongue. I continue to monitor uh, the war in uh, Ukraine. And uh, so just I, I going to talk uh, within the framework of my knowledge. So, so let's go. Iran and Russia growing ties. Uh, as we all heard, uh, of course, in media uh, outlets uh, about growing Iran ties. Now let's check what it is about. First of all, it's about economic cooperation. Uh, official declarations, meaning that uh, both Iranian and Russian uh, officials bossed their growing ties. Iran has never condemned Russia's invasion in Ukraine. Iranian drones murder Ukrainian civilians and they hit uh, civilian infrastructures, uh, cutting the energy supply in Ukraine. Uh, it is uh, it's about a possible supply of Iranian ballistic missiles to Russia, a joint production of drones, and the possible supply of uh, Russia Su-35 warplanes that Sarah has mentioned just now. And uh, the question is, uh, what is real on the ground and what is only interpretation? First of all, when we talk about drones, uh, I am obliged to, to make some precisions. There are two types of drones that media usually uh, don't, don't distinguish, uh, but it is a different, a completely different type of drones with real implications on the ground. Uh, usually, drone is a catchword. It is not a military term. The real term is UAV unmanned uh, air vehicle and uh, this is the uh, UA, UAV or drone Moha, uh, Mohajer 6 what you see here on the top of the page it's Iranian uh, it's an Iranian UAV with uh, highly developed capacities but it is, if you can see here in the picture, it's a really a little play, which means that uh, operators of uh, such a plane must be really trained pilots. They, they are, usually they sit uh, in, a, in a command uh, crew cabin cockpit somewhere, somewhere on the ground, thousand kilometers from the target, from the battlefield, and uh, you need to have a crew of at least two uh, people or three to operate such a, pl uh, such a plane, because it's a plane, to, uh, to manipulate its uh, navigation systems and also to use weapons. And uh, uh, no one knows how many such drones Iran has already supplied it to Russia, but uh, no matter the number, uh, it is impossible to use this drone without a lengthy training. In Israel, for example, to become an operator of a, of a drone, it requires a course of it's a course of a fighter jet pilots uh, that lasts only two th two years and a half. Meaning that if, even if the uh, Russians got these drones, they cannot use them effectively because you, you must train a lot. Otherwise, you just uh, destroy this uh, costly machine. And uh, what, is, uh, what really hits, uh, strikes Ukrainian civilian infrastructures and uh, civilians, it is Shahed. 336. Uh, it is Shahed, not Shahid, but Shahed. It means a scout in uh, Persian. It is not a drone, properly speaking. It is a primitive cruise missile. It is cheap. Uh, one can buy its uh, details and ingredients and parts on eBay and uh, manufacture such a thing that is uh, pretty effective and efficient. And it's, uh, it does the job between the brackets. And uh, this is about the 
the weapons that Iranian supply to Russia. It's not about other sophisticated drones that Iran has been using for, uh, for a decade against Israel, against Saudi Arabia, uh, through Houthis in Yemen and Hezbollah and so on. And uh, finally, it is important to mention that uh, the Iranian drones or uh, whatever, loitering munition, it doesn't have any serious impact on the course of war because it does uh, target civilian structures and civilians, but still it cannot target Ukrainian fighting units uh, or other units of uh, uh, the Ukrainian armored force. And the third is the, uh, the warplane, uh, Russian warplane Su-35, which may be supplied sooner or later, but it is uh, nothing. Un nothing is uh, known concretely. And here is uh, I am coming to, to, to the next point, which is facts and interpretations. Because first, it's a loitering munition, not UAV. As the, the distinction is very important because of its implications, as I have just mentioned, non plug on the ground and. Uh, when one talks about an Iran-Russia alliance, one should uh, always bear in mind that uh, the history of uh, Russia-Iranian relationship is uh, plagued with mistrust and suspicion because uh, their history is complicated to say the least. Russia, also uh, Tsarist Russia 300 years ago, uh, tried to encroach on Iranian territory to to occupy uh, Iranian land. The Soviet Union meddled on uh, numerous occasions in, uh, into Iranian politics. Uh, in Iran, there was a communist party, a real communist party today, that was uh, commanded by uh, by Moscow. So, and uh, now the majority of Iranian people mistrust uh, the Russian regi regime because it is perceived of as a supporter of the of their own regime it is not it is not 100 percent true but still uh, the uh, Iranian regime takes into consideration uh, all the limits of uh, the support it can uh, provide uh, harness uh, for Russia's effort in Ukraine. And here it is important to understand that Iran does not support a Russian war in Ukraine. It's not true. Uh, Iran only sells uh, drones to earn money, nothing else. And of course, neither Russia nor Iran are ready to do for each other for free. That doesn't, doesn't exist. It sounds like a beginning of a joke that uh, Iranians uh, or Russians are ready to help each other for free. It doesn't exist, but they can uh, they can cooperate in some niches that they find that uh, is mutually profitable for them. For example, like this niche of drones is important for the Russians because the Russians neglected this domain over the years and they simply don't have drones. So the Iranians uh, made real achievements in this way. And uh, uh, by the same token, it, uh, uh, Iran, uh, Russia will never do something because uh, the Iranians want. They may continue to want or to, to demand, still it is impossible because the relations between Russia and Iran, just as between Russia and uh, China and between uh, Iran and China, are never relations between peers. It doesn't exist between uh, these three countries, uh, where is each of them is naughty and arrogant and proud of uh, its history and, and achievements. I don't know what they deem as achievements, but uh, here what exists. Uh, here you see a picture of two hedgehogs. Why? What is the? How is it linked to the hedgehogs? So there is an adage in Russian that uh, illustrates illustrates the best the relationship between Russia and Iran. It's uh, like uh, two hedgehogs uh, make love. They want, but it hurts. So this is the principle. And uh, finally, also the domestic troubles in Iran, the popular protest, protest of women for democracy, Zan Zindegi Azadi, 
uh, women, life, liberty. The protest goes on, but still, unfortunately, uh, it has no impact on the nuclear file or on Iran's regional policies, meaning that uh, the Iranian regime, regime continues business as usual. It continues as enrichment and uh, nothing changed because uh, all, uh, nothing changed, although the protest uh, is going on. Uh, regarding the nuclear file, uh, when we talk about enrichment, uh, we must hold in mind that enrichment is still not a nuclear weapons, because to build nuclear weapons, a country must uh, uh, pass other three stages. These stages are nuclear warhead. Uh, it means that one uh, has to build an explosive device uh, specifically for a nuclear warhead. It's, uh, you cannot put just a uh, nuclear payload into a normal conventional warhead. It's rather difficult. They're trying to do that, but still, uh, with the help of uh, God, the uh, CIA and Mossad, they still have not succeeded in that. Uh, hopefully, they will not, but it is a, another stage to pass. Uh, second, they must uh, improve missile accuracy, meaning that uh, the current missile accuracy of Iranian missiles is something about 87%, whereas the nuclear missile requires uh, the accuracy of 97%, no less because otherwise it's too dangerous. And uh, the final stage is to conduct a nuclear test. Only when a country conducts a nuclear test it may be declared as possessing nuclear weapons. And uh, still it has not yet, uh, it has not uh, happened yet, but it will happen sooner or later. But still we are not there. And it is important uh, to hold in mind. You know, here on the top of the page, you see the manifest, uh, demonstration of women in Iran, because women are the most, uh, active in the protest, at least at the beginning of the protest. And uh, the, on the bottom of the page, you see the, a, a list of uh, Iranian nuclear installations that are, that are in, uh, their location is known and uh, it's not secret. And uh, finally, Israel's dilemmas. Uh, the first thing I think it is important to emphasize to foreign audience that Israel is a vulnerable tiny country in the Middle East with no soft power. This is a, this is a fact. No matter what the government is in power or uh, what the policy is, uh, this is an objective uh, given situation that no government can change. Hence, Israel's policies have always been, is and will be the policy of survival. Uh, simply speaking, uh, Israel cannot have American policies, be it on Russia, Ukraine, Iran, or anything else. In politics in general, in general, every step comes with a price tag. There are no good options, no matter what we are talking about. Uh, good options in policy and politics doesn't exist or exists rarely. Uh, so dilemma is, the main dilemma for Israel is that Israel, on the one hand, has to maintain good ties with Russia, not only because of uh, the Russian presence in Syria, but also because of other things such as, for example, uh, Jews in Russia, Jews in Ukraine, if Israel has to evacuate Jews from either Russia or Ukraine, so coordination with Russia is indispensable. Besides of that, uh, one should never forget that uh, exactly because uh, the Russian regime has no qualms, it can do everything, and it has a myriad of ways to make uh, Israel's life bitter. Uh, and the other side of the coin is uh, support for Ukraine because uh, Israel has to maintain good ties with Russia, but of course this, uh, uh, this move comes uh, with a price tag, which is uh, an easiness uh, in the West with Israel's ties, because of Israel's ties with Russia and uh, vice versa. 
And uh, finally, Russia may, when uh, we talk about uh, possible uh, worsening of relations between uh, Russia, between Russia and Israel, for example, it, uh, it may manifest itself in Syria. Uh, so the Russia may alternate its modus operandi in Syria, but uh, I'm pretty certain that even if it happens, still it has not happened yet, even if it happens, it will happen only out of Russia's interest, not because uh, of uh, Iranian demand. And this is the, for all other directions, Israel continues the same policy of containing or, or thwarting, preventing, whatever, because uh, as I said, Iran, Iran's behavior is business as usual, they continue their regional policies against, uh, simply speaking, support for terrorism, against Israel, against the Arab countries, against the Gulf countries. For example, only two weeks ago, there was an attempt to attack an Israeli uh, uh, ship uh, in the Gulf. Uh, likewise, uh, IRGC speedboats systematically approach U.S. Uh, warships and uh, nothing happens, so they will continue probably to do the same, and Israel will continue the same steps, uh, ranging from thwarting uh, the attacks by Islamic uh, Jihad in Palestine, which is a pro-Iranian org uh, organization, and uh, conducting operations in Iran uh, against Iranian nuclear installations, against uh, a revolutionary guard corps. Uh, however, the, there is a new development now in Iran that uh, since a year, I would say, roughly speaking, uh, no uh, Israeli or whoever else uh, strikes on uh, the regime installations are perceived as, as a strike against Iran because the overwhelming majority of Iran despise the Iranian regime, uh, whereas Israel was always cautious not to, in, to, to conduct operations that might be considered as uh, operations against Iran, as a state, as a country, as a nation, not as a regime. So Israel always distinguished between the Iranian people and uh, the Iranian regime. Uh, so this is the end of my representation, and I would like to add some words uh, as a human being and as a Jew, not only as an intelligence officer and the analyst. Because uh, on the one hand, of course, uh, intelligence officer may sober, wise, uh, calculate, but we all are also human beings, and uh, I cannot be objective in the sense of absence of feelings or attitude toward what happens in uh, Iran or Ukraine. You know, the first uh, saying is that of the general pattern that maybe I'm wrong, but uh, it is forgotten in today's America. The object of war is not to die for your country, but to make the other bastard die for his. So when we talk about the war in Ukraine, how to uh, finish, uh, one should uh, hold in mind this saying by General Patton. The second phrase is za našu i vašu svobodu, za našu i vašu, for your and uh, our liberty, in, there is a typo here, sorry, in uh, Polish and Russian, it was an ancient uh, Polish slogan since the 19th century, uh, when Polish patriots supported the Russian Decembrist uprising against the Tsarist autocracy. This, uh, and uh, this, uh, further, the slogan became that of uh, Soviet dissidents, and now it's a slogan of the fight for Ukraine, for your and our liberty which resonates strongly with the Iranian slogan, Zanz and the Gazadi, uh, woman, uh, freedom, uh, life. Uh, woman, life, freedom, which is very unusual if we compare these Iranian slogans that are really authentically democratic, patriotic, not nationalistic or anti-Israeli, anti-American, 
uh, or something like that. It's very, it's a great development, particularly if you compare to those Iranian slogans with the slogans of the Arab Springs. There was no democratic slogans there ten years ago. So here, uh, here uh, on the top of the page, you see Mar de Mihan Abadi, man. Uh, Man, motherland construction and the uh, Zans in the Giazadi somewhere, somewhere beneath there, and uh, on the top, on the bottom of the page is, uh, is the Russian slogan, Russian of Union, Polish slogans, Russia, Russia, Svobodu. And the final uh, thing that I want to say is that I uh, happen uh, to to talk uh, frequently with uh, Iranian friends, of course, abroad. And uh, I feel very uneasy to, to, to give them advice, like a kibitz or a backseat driver, being a, a potato coach, military advisor. It's not agreeable for me because people are risking their lives. What can I tell them? So my, I think my message is Jewish, that of uh, belief and uh, in freedom, uh, because if you want to win, you must believe in the possibility to win. You must uh, be and remain optimistic and uh, hold and have belief because uh, objectively speaking, I have no idea, rationally speaking, how to topple the Iranian regime or how to expel the Russians from Ukraine. So this is, um, I come to the end and thank you for listening. Thank you, Alex. So I'd like to transition now to a few questions. Um, so I have a few questions and then I'll open it up to questions from the audience. So my first question is, according to the IAEA uh, director, Rafael Grossi, the Iranian nuclear program has been galloping ahead. Um, do you think Russia has played any part in the development of the Iranian nuclear program in considering the recent deepening ties uh, between Moscow and Tehran, do you think they would be willing to assist Iran in proliferating? Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, Joseph. I think, however, that Russia has not uh, helped Iran in uh, its uh, nuclear program. There are many reasons for that. First, there is, um, as I said, mistrust. The, for example, uh, construction of uh, Boucher nuclear plants took up uh, something like 16 years, which Ira the Iranians see as a proof of the Russian deceit and, and the mistrust, because uh, usually it usually takes up like uh, four years. Uh, second thing, uh, Russians uh, don't want to see nuclear Iran. Of course, Iran will never threaten Russia with nukes, but still, they they, they don't really don't like them. Iran, Russia has some contentious issues with Iran, for example, uh, regarding the uh, territorial waters in the Caspian Sea. There are many issues, and they are not happy to do that. And uh, uh, finally, we also must remember that still the communication between Washington and Moscow and my, Moscow is there. There is a red line and the Washington and Moscow communicate about the nuclear issues and the so and so. So I don't think and uh, also I'm sure that the American intelligence community would, uh, would have intercepted any Russian nuclear move if they really wanted to do that. Uh, but yes, uh, for Iranians are able to, to rush into their nuclear goals. Thank you. Um, my next question is, as you've mentioned, um, Iran is set to receive 24 Sukhoi 35 fighter jets. So numerous reports have mentioned that Iran is additionally interested in acquiring the S-400 missile uh, defense system from Russia as well. Um, this is the same missile defense system that caused a big uproar when Turkey was set to acquire it, I believe, a few years back. Um, so what are the chances of this happening? And what do you think the potential consequences of this would be if they were able to acquire the S-400? I think that there is uh, more more chances that they will get uh, S300 or 400 because they already have some systems. 
uh, it is uh, easier to supply uh, these air defense systems uh, than uh, the warplanes. Regarding the warplanes, it is uh, possible, but the problem is that everything is possible theoretically. Uh, for the time being, uh, there is no contract, there is no proof that it really happens. And even if it happens, it is still, it's about a dozen or 20 warplanes that it takes up uh, time to build them, even longer time to train pilots. The more sophisticated uh, the warplane is, the more uh, uh, training uh, pilot, uh, fighter jet pilot uh, is required to undergo. Uh, so to and, and I also think that even if they even if uh, let's take a pessimistic uh, scenario they get the planes I don't think they constitute a serious threat to to the region's security and of course not to Israel's security because overall it is true that the Iran uh, Iranian air force is obsolete and uh, 20 or a dozen or 20 or 30 warplanes won't change that because you cannot uh, wage a war with only 20 warplanes uh, and of course not the long range missions like striking Israel or something like that. Also some Iranian uh, military expert, re experts reiterated on several occasions that the the Iranian air capacity is uh, is based on deterrence. Uh, deterrence in Iranian parlance means asymmetric capacity. What uh, what uh, the asymmetric capacity is? It is missiles and uh, drones, UAVs, uh, lottery munition, uh, because this is the capacity of Iran. Iran is a very weak country in terms of uh, military might, but this asymmetric capacity can indeed strike Israel. Uh, for example, Hezbollah, Hezbollah mi missiles arsenal can strike every point across the, across the territory of Israel. And by the way, what's going on in Ukraine with these uh, Shahad uh, missiles, the cruise missiles only illustrates what Israel has always warning against that uh, because uh, the the danger of the GCPOA is not that it is bad because it is bad. No, it is not as bad as it seems to be. The problem with the GCP is and has been or was, I don't know what will be the, in the future, that it uh, sort of legitimized the Iranian regional policies. What the Iran's original policies are, it is this. This is Iranian uh, drones and missiles in the hands of Hezbollah or other proxies. But when Israel was warning about that, uh, against that uh, three years ago, it was perceived of as just Israeli uh, sabal rattling or Israeli hysteria. Now, when uh, people see what is going on in Ukraine, so they hopefully think otherwise. Thank you. Um, so, despite the humanitarian aid that Israel has been supplying Ukraine, there have been many or at least some voices in Europe and the US calling on Israel to provide military aid as well, despite Russian objections. What do you think the outcome of supplying this aid would be for Israel? Uh, well, I think uh, Israel will continue uh, supplying this humanitarian aid. I know that there is uh, there are some sorts of military aid that Israel does supply to Ukraine, but of course it is never done publicly. It should not uh, done publicly. And what you mentioned is. Um, I think it's rather media reports or a small talk of journalists or politicians is not what, uh, I'm not sure this is uh, really what's going on in, in the corridors of power because even Ukraine, for example, Ukrainian uh, military officers never mentioned this issue of 
for example, of Iron Dome or other Israeli systems. Why? Because they understand it will be of uh, little help to Ukraine because uh, such a system as Iron Dome is designed for Israel's th threats, meaning just simple Hamas missiles. It's not designed to counter Russian long range ballistic missiles. And uh, it requires a uh, deployment of many systems that simply don't exist. And for the moment, the most crucial issue for Ukraine is tanks, tanks, and tanks, and numbers. So how are the deepening ties between Russia and Iran affecting Iranian proxies in the region, such as Hezbollah, um, Houthi rebels and militant Palestinian groups like the Palestinian Islamic Jihad or Hamas? Um, I don't think it affects directly the ties of Iran and the Iranian proxies. However, it may affect the readiness of Russian of the Russians to, for example, to prevent uh, deployment of pro-Iranian militias or Hezbollah in Syria. It is also important to remember that the Russians don't control the entirety of the Syrian territory. They don't like uh, the Iranian presence in Ladakhia, which is a Russian uh, like a port hub, uh, but uh, they may ignore this or another which is indeed dangerous, and all the uh, all other things that we already mentioned. It is true that uh, they have not yet happened, that they may happen, and for that reason, it is important to remain vigilant and also to signal uh, the Russians. I don't even think of that because uh, we, uh, with all my reasoning that I explained the Russians, no one really knows what is turning out in their head, and uh, no, no one knows what Putin will decide <laughs> tomorrow. So what has Prime Minister Netanyahu's response been to the deepening of Russian and Iranian ties? Well, I think uh, for the moment, uh, Netanyahu has abstained of any public comments about uh, deepening the Russian and Iranian ties. However, I also think that the Russians, that I don't think I know, in fact, that the Russians are aware of, uh, of these uh, nuances, let's call it that, this way. They don't want the uh, war, of course, between uh, Iran and Israel. And uh, the, uh, the Russians also know that uh, the Iranians hate uh, Russian smugglers operation with Israel, but still Iran not do much and they, I but I am sure that if Israel for example uh, supplies publicly and overtly really military systems to Ukraine then uh, Russians could uh, alternate something in Syria it's not uh, that's uh, for sure and again also the important thing in Syria is not that uh, the Russians may try to hinder our uh, air raids in Syria. It's not such a, it's not a big deal because the Israeli pilots are experienced. They know the techniques of the missile dodging uh, that the Russians may shoot down a civilian plane as they have already done in Ukraine in 2014. This is a, I would say, bigger danger for Israel than just uh, Russian missiles on an Israeli military warplane. Do you think the Russians would shoot down an Israeli civilian plane on purpose? Uh, I don't think so. But again, here we're we're dealing with the regime that uh, if, if you, uh, I think they won't do that. But if you, I'm sincere with you. If you have asked me two years ago about the war with uh, Russia, uh, between Russia and Ukraine, is it possible? Well, I would, uh, I would have sent you to a shrink. Still, it is a reality. So we, it's very dangerous to say, to say that it is impossible because it is possible. Everything is possible. So does Iran have trained pilots to operate the Sukhoi 35s that they may be receiving from Russia? 
The, uh, Iran, yes, Iranians may send uh, people to, to train in Russia. I don't believe the Russians will come to run to train, uh, to train the pilots there because, well, the hands of uh, the Mossad are allegedly long there, so it's uh, safer to, to do that in Russia. But uh, again, it is a very uh, training of a fighter jet pilot is a very lengthy process it's not uh, it's not uh, it's not tomorrow evening and not even after tomorrow so it's very it won't it won't it won't change much uh, which is uh, much more dangerous is indeed if uh, the russians decide to supply the air defense missile uh, missile systems like s uh, 300 s 400 it is real but still it is for example i remember that in the beginning of the 2000 Russians delivered some uh, such systems to the Iranians, but it was uh, much procrastination and obstruction from the rush from the Russian part. Even after the Iranians paid the first inst installment, so it's very it's not as easy as it seems. And uh, there is also another last uh, important nuance. I am not sure at all that uh, currently the Russian military industry is uh, capable to deliver because they lack the parts because of the Western sanctions, and the Russian military industry is not, it cannot produce uh, enough projectiles, artillery, ammunition. Uh, you, can, you can hear Wagner, Wagner fighters, terrorists, whatever, they were uh, beseeching the Minister of Defense to give them more ammunition, so they don't have produce. I'm not sure. Uh, well, so why do they need Iranian missiles? Not because they need Iranian technology, because Iranian missiles are cheaper and faster to manufacture than the Russian ones. So to move a little bit uh, away from the Middle East, what does what do you think Iran's cooperation with uh, Russia means for NATO, the United States, and Europe? Uh, well, it's uh, in general, it's uh, it's bad. Well, because it's bad, of course, it uh, is a bad picture because it's uh, two ruthless, uh, corrupt uh, regimes. Not. Uh, not nice, but in terms of real damage to NATO or to, to the US, I would not uh, exaggerate too much. It's uh, very easy to overestimate its importance. Um, as I say, simply, they cannot, uh, the, is Russia, uh, can Russia uh, sell some uh, weapons to Iran? Yes, but besides of that, it's not, uh, the Russians are not uh, eager to buy Iran made uh, cars and uh, I doubt that Iran and Russia can uh, trade oil with each other. So it uh, simply doesn't work. But uh, what, what, what I, I would say that what is much more dangerous is a very soft reaction of the uh, U.S. military to Iranian provocations that, are, that have already been uh, going on ever since with, uh, with or without Russia because we all know that there is no way a commander of a, an Iranian speedboat decides to approach an American warship without an order from Tehran. And they know in advance that uh, the American reaction will be just uh, American concerns. I'm pretty sure that neither Washington, uh, sorry, nor uh, neither Moscow nor Tehran uh, lend uh, much credence to American concerns. So unfortunately, this is the situation. So Iran is a reliable funder of Hamas and um, other Palestinian groups. Is Iran or these Palestinian groups um, at all concerned that a nuclear attack on Israel would mean harming Palestinians as well? Uh, no, I don't think so because, uh, well, first of all, they never they never evoke that publicly. It's not just something we're going to speculate what they think. Uh, but what is uh, what is real is that uh, Hamas uh, has no qualms to cooperate with Iran when it, when it needs that. But it's important to remember that I, uh, Islamic Jihad is an Iranian proxy. It's under the it's subservient to Tehran, whereas 
Hamas is a Sunni jihadi terrorist organization or a statelet that uh, has its own interests. It's not, uh, it is not subservient to Tehran. It's not that Hamas may start an escalation with Israel, but it will do that only when it fits it, not because uh, Iran orders them. Overall, of course, it is, uh, for example, uh, what will happen if the Yemeni Houthis launch a missile uh, on Elat. The Israel will face a serious problem because uh, we will have to retaliate, but uh, uh, what, is, uh, what is the target? This is the force of the wisdom of Iranian asymmetric capacity, of the denial capacity, and so they're developing a, even further this capacity. Does Israel have the capability to disable or destroy the Iranian nuclear program? And uh, if it does, would such a strike lead to war? Uh, well, I don't, uh, it's an imperative information that I simply don't know, but I know, however, uh, for sure that uh, Israeli officers and officials never disclose all Israeli capacities. This is the first thing. Of course, it is not. Uh, or it's interesting that when those who criticize Israel's uh, military option, they use a strawman argument because they stick to only one possibility of such a strike. There are other possibilities of strike. For example, such a strike may be in parallel against other targets. There are pretty, there are numerous uh, possibilities of how can, one can conduct a strike, but I'm sure it will not uh, spark a war because no, Iran has no allies. If you mean a war between Israel and Hezbollah, yes. It's for sure that if uh, Hezbollah, I estimate that Hezbollah will start a war against Israel only in the event of an Israeli attack uh, on Iranian nuclear installations. But uh, besides of that, it's, hard, it's uh, hardly imaginable who will fight uh, inside Iran. Iran is alone. Iran knows that. So how much autonomy does Iran have in Syria and what is the relationship with Russia there? Uh, the uh, relations uh, with the Russians in Syria are also tense because they all, or I know that uh, Russian officers on the ground don't like Iranians because they, as the Russians claim, at least the, uh, you can never trust Iranian officers that they never assume responsibility and so on and so. However, uh, the Russians have no qualms either to hinder Iranians in the in the in other in other regions where the Russians are not so strong, and uh, they are just uh, one must remember that the Russian interest in Syria is only one: is to preserve Assad's power and nothing else. They don't care. They don't care about anything else. But to preserve a Russian uh, Assad's power, it, you don't need to hold their many military units. It's just enough to prevent Damascus. And uh, what the Iranians are doing in Syria, they continue to deploy their missile arsenal that will be used by uh, pro-Iranian militias. Because, again, there is no Iranian army or RGC corps in Iran in terms of deploy units deployment. There are Iranian advisors and some hiring officers who instruct the pro-Iranian uh, militias who are just a cannon fodder for Iranians. They don't like to send their own people to die in Syria. And, uh, but they have this missile arsenal. And by, on the way, the Iranians are changing the demographic uh, landscape of Syria. Syria is gradually becoming a Shiite country. This is what's going on now in Syria. So when you say that Syria is becoming a Shiite country, do you mean that Iran is moving in uh, Shia Arabs to change the demographics? Yes, because this is a, it's not a, it is not a, of course, a, something like a transfer or like exchange of populations, but as a very many Syrian Sunnis became refugees, 
they escape to, to other regions of Syria or Turkey. And instead of them, Iran is importing between the brackets some, uh, for example, Afghani or Pakistani militias. They don't even speak Arabic, but they take, uh, for example, Afghani teenagers, pay their families uh, something like $500 or $1,000 if they die, and their family can be awarded the Iranian nationality and uh, there uh, there is no uh, these uh, teenagers have no other way than going to syria something like wagner uh, inmates uh, in russia so the same principle so how does russia see uh, these you know afghan and pakistanis that iran is bringing into syria are they um, okay with that or is this something yes. that they don't really mind yeah, they, they, they never mind. Well, well first, uh, morally, of course, they are doing uh, more or less the same with their own uh, uh, Russian citizens. And of course, they don't, simply don't care about what uh, these uh, Persians or Arabs are doing to each other. So it's not their, it's not, it's not their business. And they say it overtly, it's not my just speculation. So how does Israel balance uh, the relationship on its northern border in Syria between Russia and Iran? How, do, how does it approach Russia in order to be able to carry out uh, strikes when it needs to? Uh, well, as far as I know, the mechanism of uh, mutual communication that was established uh, between, uh, not between the the countries between uh, Israeli military officers and the Russian military officers in Syria. So hitherto, it has worked, it works. It's true that uh, recently both Iran and uh, Russia jointly condemned uh, an act of uh, Israeli aggression because the Russians uh, must uh, do something because they're required to do something, but nothing specific has happened hitherto. So I think it, hopefully it will continue this way and it continues. Because Israel also does not, uh, you know, the principle is this, as long as Israel does not strike Russian interests or of course Russian officers or Assad, they don't care. But the danger is what will happen if Iranians try to to deploy their missiles or drones or units uh, within uh, uh, a region under Russian control. That uh, would be a very uneasy situation for Israel. Sure. So um, what, ha I mean, from what you've seen, I, I know that East Asia is a little bit, um, you know, uh, not, it's, it's not in the region, but what is what is China's role been in this uh, Russian Iranian relationship, and how are they seeing it play out? Uh, China would say that, uh, according to what I just asked other uh, people more knowledge knowledgeable than me in China, that they they despise both uh, Russians and Iranians. Of course, China has no intention whatsoever to help Russia. Uh, Russia for China is uh, just a gasoline station uh, with missiles. Uh, this is what Russia is. China needs Russia to buy cheaper uh, oil and uh, gasoline, so and so. And in Iran, uh, they would uh, they would like to subconvert uh, American sanctions, but again, Russia is uh, China. Unlike Russia, China is always economically motivated. They won't do something only to, to harm America. Because, for example, you can see that most uh, solid uh, Chinese companies uh, don't try to bypass sanctions on Russia or Iran because they know that they will lose American market. So this is the principle. In the Iran, they pay, there is a treaty between Iran and uh, China but here's the case exactly as these, as it is with the Russian-Iranian military contract. So there is a lot of talk. No one has ever seen the text of the treaty. No one knows. 
The only thing which is known for sure that it will be China and only China will decide how and uh, where and when this contract is uh, put uh, into practice. And in principle, I would say, I, again, I don't know, but uh, the Chinese are wary of insecurity, of instability, so they may, they may invest in the, the, to colonize another country, like what happened in Pakistan. Pakistan became a Chinese colony, the Gwadar port. So this is will, what will happen in Iran. The Iranians also understand that, I mean, rank and file. But uh, Iran isn't, isn't safe for them because against the backdrop of all this tension with Iran with weapons, Iranian regime policies, I don't think uh, Chinese are eager to enter them or to help someone. They may sell things, of course, but again, only when they see that it is really profitable for them. Okay, um, I'd like to ask just um, one final question. Um, we at Amet um, feel very strongly as um, the former Soviet um, dissident and nuclear physicist, a physicist Andrei Sakharov had said that if you want to know a nation's foreign policy, look at the way they treat their internal dissident population. And we have been outraged that over 19,000 dissidents have been arrested at least four hung, over 500 shot on the spot, um, including 58 children, yet there's been very little news coverage in the United States. And the news coverage that we get recently seems to say that it's um, petered off or um, that you know, there's there's very little of it right now. Although I saw something yesterday in ABC News saying that the demonstrations in Colm of all places, which is a, a religious, a theological, and a Shiite stronghold, um, were picking up. Um, do you have, first of all, any idea of the strength of the demonstrations, Alex? And number two, do we have any idea of the breakdown in terms of the civil society of the next generation? How many eventually would like to see the regime overthrown? Look, it's a very important but very difficult question to answer because we let us factor it into several segments. First, how uh, the demonstrations are going on. It depends upon intensity, of course, but it can change every month, every week. And it's very sporadic and it can be different in every town. In principle, one can follow them if you see, for example, on Twitter. So you can see the intensity of every demonstration. It's not a problem. The problem is, uh, lies in another direction or realm is that this, um, this movement is spontaneous and it lacks leadership. And it's something very important to understand because, uh, well, history teaches that it teaches nothing, but still the historical experience uh, shows us that all the autocratic regimes, usually all when their protectors switch side or at least stand idle, or there is a, a and of course, when on, on, an, on the opposite side, you have a steadfast uh, leadership that really knows uh, what it wants. Your question is a uh, hundred percent, even secret surveys that the Iranians conduct and say that 70 percent of Iran's population, including religious people, would vote against the Islamic Republic. But still, as we, have, as we say in Hebrew, when you have friends and bodies, you don't need a protection. So these guys, they have power. So you can, the Iranian people, the Iranian youth, Iranian women, it's nice, but still, they don't take strategic decisions. And there is another strategic important question is that, unfortunately, we have not yet seen elite split in Iran because there are, yes, still a minority, but it is elites who may support regime not because they like Putin or Khamenei, they simply, this is their alternative. They have some perks from this system. They have no reason to topple it because they owe the people who were born into this system, they have no objective reason to to hate it and when unless these elites don't split or decide that look there is another alternative let's uh, join them 
I do I can hardly imagine how the region topples, but it is true, however, that no matter what they do, the problems, the socioeconomic problems around there are so pressing. And the regime has no idea how to start resolving them. And also the regime is limited because the regime is ruthless, yes, but neither a Russian nor Iranian regime want to become like a Saddam regime, like she would indulge in indiscriminate killing. So they, they do that, but they understand their limit. So it is a very explosive situation yet, but no one knows how many years it will, it will uh, it will uh, continue. The only thing, the optimistic thing that I can think, I can say that is, I see that Iranian civil society exists. It's vibrant, it's very well developed, it's way more developed than non-existent civil society. And I can imagine, I can hardly imagine a corruption for Iran, but I can imagine democratic Iran, it's different things. Okay, thank you so much, Joseph, for your debut. Um, and in terms of moderating this and um and and for your work for Ahmed and Alex, um, thank you so so much for your years and years of accumulated wisdom and knowledge thank you. about this very, very important topic. Um uh, please join us next week, same time, same place, um, where we are going to have the wonderful legal scholar Avi Bell, who is on the faculty of Bar Ilan University and um, the UC San Diego system, talking um, about some facts that very few people understand about the Supreme Court issue. Um, so it will be our pleasure to host him as it has been our pleasure to, to host you, Alex. And we want Thank to wish you a great week. Thanks so much. Thank you.